Welcome, welcome to um, my session, which is uh, focus on memory. My name is Vaughan Jones, and um, I'm going to be speaking today uh, about memory in particular. Um, I am one of the co-authors of the Focus series, which is a new uh, course for upper secondary um, students. Uh, along with my co-author Sue Kay, who will be speaking next week. So, um, I think we're okay now. Everybody's hearing me. Um, there is limited interaction with the webinar, but we'll try a few things as we go along. Uh, if there are technical problems, uh, I'll probably just throw my hands around and worry, but hopefully there won't be. Um, I am speaking to you from my home, which is in uh, the wonderful Deddington, a uh, classic English village in the middle of the country. Um, it is about 2,500 people, and um, the weather is not like that today, just to let you know. But um, I'd like to talk to you principally about some of the uh, beliefs we have as teachers and writers that have informed us as we have written the uh, course. And um, I don't know about you, but um, I find uh, teaching and learning rather um, a mystery, shall we say. Um, one of my favourite uh, images is this uh, kid's representation of an old adage in English, which is, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. This is an opportunity for me, as one of the authors of the course, to get a little bit behind the beliefs and the ideas which underpin the course. Um, and as I was saying, uh, for me, learning a language, teaching a language, is quite a mysterious process. When I first started, um, I thought that what the students, uh, what I taught the students, the students would learn. But um, sadly, I realise that's not necessarily true. Um, and at best, there's probably only a loose correlation between what we teach and what the students learn. And as I wanted to illustrate with this old adage here, you could lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. In a similar way, you could lead a student to um, a set of words that you want them to learn, but you can't make them learn. Uh, or you can lead them to the present perfect, but you can't make them use it correctly. So this is one of the issues we have um, with teaching and learning, this loose correlation. However, all of the research um, suggests that taught learners um, do progress faster and do ultimately arrive at a higher level at of attainment. But they do it in their, the, uh, their own order and at their own speed and sometimes you might teach something a uh, hundred times and they won't learn it other times uh, they might learn something that you haven't taught so as I say it's a loose correlation within that um, for us myself and author Sue Kay there are some important prerequisites if any learning at all is to take place and this is what we call um, the three M's. Um, and I'd like to investigate these very briefly with you, uh, but my focus will be on memory uh, for the rest of this webinar. But let's just quickly talk about all three. Um, motivation. Um, Noam Chomsky stated very famously once, the truth of the matter is about 99% of teaching is making the students feel interested in the material and the rest has to do with your methods. Um, this was something which uh, uh, he maybe overstated, shall we say, um, but uh, there is some truth in it. Um, your first point, if you like, is to engage the students. And the way that we've tried to do that in materials is to make it relevant to the students, make the uh, take as our starting point, if you like, what the students bring into the class themselves, their thoughts, their ideas, their feelings, 
Um, and uh, this is something which uh, we try and make our materials focus on um, because you need to engage the students, otherwise you, you'll get nowhere. The second M is memory, and I'm going to speak uh, uh, about this mainly in my uh, webinar today. Um, the thing here, just to say briefly, is that uh, a lot of what we do in the classroom, a lot of the way that our learning is staged suggests that learning is a kind of linear business where students neatly go through um, the process step by step. Uh, they go through unit one, then two, then three, then four. Uh, but of course, we know uh, from our own experience that learning is, is not a linear, neat business. It's a very messy business. One step forward, two steps back, three steps forward. And we need to cater for that in what we do in the classroom, um, in particular, to try and uh, 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 make the uh, language that we are teaching move from the short term memory into the long term memory. Um, Paul Nation suggested uh, a range of five to 16 encounters with a word for anybody to really acquire it. And um, I think the golden number seems to be around about seven. But how many of us can faithfully put our hands on our hearts to say that we've definitely made sure that our students have seen or encountered a word at least seven times? Uh, it's a difficult one and um, something which we, which we need to strive to, to do. Uh, but it really is the recognition or the, um, the recognition that uh, learning is messy and you need lots and lots and lots of goes at something before you can finally master it. And the third M um, that underpins our course is the M for meaning. Um, in this case, meaningful practice. Um, we feel very strongly that whatever we get our students to do in the classroom uh, should uh, have an attempt to get them to exchange meanings because after all that's what a language does it makes meanings um, Rod Ellis in uh, one of the many quotes I could have used to illustrate this uh, suggested that it's the need to get meanings across and the pleasure experience when this is achieved that motivates second language acquisition so meaning is uh, and always should be at the center of what we do um, when we are teaching and learning languages. But as I say, my webinar is going to be looking more specifically at uh, memory. There will be sessions on uh, meaning by my colleague Sue Kay in a week's time. And then there will be another session on motivation uh, by one of our Pearson colleagues, Rob Dean, uh, a week after that. But today I'd like to focus on memory. And memory is crucial. As Socrates said, learning is remembering. Or well, we think he said that anyway. Um, and this is a quote which I find uh, very um, interesting because, of course, we never really have perfect knowledge of, of words. I should say at this point that when we're talking about memory, we're really talking about remembering words, words, lexical items, whatever you want to call them. Uh, it's words that our students need more than anything, um, increasing their knowledge of words, increasing the size of their mental lexicon. That is what will help them in all the other areas of their learning, um, their listening skills, uh, their reading skills, their writing skills. The number of words is, is crucial and we need to increase those as, as, as well and as much as we can. But this uh, nice uh, quote from F. Twaddle here um, talks about the fact that our knowledge never is really 100%. Um, we may know a very large number of words with various degrees of vagueness, words which are in the twilight zone between the darkness of entire unfamiliarity and the brightness of complete familiarity. And I kind of like that idea that we're trying to move our students towards, towards the light um, and, and away from the darkness. Um, so that's an image that, uh, that I feel is, is quite useful. Um, but considering we're talking about words here, 
Um, I'd like to ask you uh, three simple questions uh, on my next slide. How, see how you get on with these. First one, how many words are there in the English language? Second one, how many words do you know in your own language? And thirdly, how many words does the average intermediate or B1 student of English know? I wonder if you'd like to uh, have a go. Anybody like to throw up some numbers? I'm looking in the chat box here for, uh, for how many words in the English language. Well, we have... Um, 500,000, 50,000, 25,000, 130,000, 5 million. <laughs> so quite interesting um, answers to that. Well, of course, uh, somebody uh, uh, actually wrote earlier on, who knows? And that's kind of um, the answer. But actually, the studies suggest that there are around about a million. If you take into account um, all the different terms for the flora and the fauna in the Amazon rainforest, etc., etc., uh, there's probably about a million words in the English language. It is a vast language. It is absolutely huge. And, um, of course, it's growing exponentially, seemingly. Uh, new words are being coined. Uh, old words are getting new meanings. It's, it's growing like wildfire. Nobody's in control. Um, and uh, it's, uh, <laughs> some people suggest it's a mess. I don't think it's a mess. I think it's incredibly rich. It is by far the biggest language in terms of the number of words. Um, but a million is clearly unattainable. Let's consider what an average, if such a thing exists, educated speaker of a native language, me in English, you in whichever language that you speak, what would you say was the passive knowledge in terms of number of words for an educated native speaker? What have we got here? We've got 30,000, 10,000, 3,000, 50,000, 10,000, 1,000, 1,000. It's very modest. Okay, again, this is not perfect knowledge, but the estimates are in the region of 25, 30,000 words. Um, and by word, of course, we mean uh, a, a word family, that is to say, an item of, of meaning, shall we say. Um, it doesn't mean that work, worked, working, uh, works are four different words, obviously. Um, so, roughly 25, 30,000 words is probably what most educated native speakers know. Uh, in terms of passive knowledge of, of their own language. And then um, the last question here, your typical B1 student, your typical intermediate student, how many words do you think they know? And I've got some answers coming in, 2,500, 1,000, 3,000. Yes, it's in the region of 2,500, 3,000 words that your B1 student knows. So roughly a tenth um, of, 10% uh, shall we say, of a native speaker. So I think it's quite interesting uh, to just frame the issue like this. There's a lot of words in a language. Uh, in English, there's a preposterous number of words. Um, but the average native speaker probably knows in the region of 25 to 30,000 and a, a typical B1 student, they know 2,500, something like that. So then, for me, the problem resides particularly at this B1 level, because students, in my experience, and I've been teaching now for over 30 years, move relatively swiftly towards what we might call the intermediate level. And I think the reason, one of the reasons they do this is that they are learning the 2,500 most frequent words. And those words are everywhere. For example, the most common word in the English language, the, accounts for somewhere around about 6 or 7% of all language, up to 8% maybe, in some cases. So, you know, even uh, William Shakespeare one in 12 of his words, approximately, was the. Uh, what, a, what a lazy guy. But, um, just joking. 
those 2,500 words, and indeed other statistics are thrown up, um, and this has all come from the wonderful work on corpus linguistics over the past uh, three or four decades. The first 100 words, that is to say the most common 100 words, account for nearly 50% of all text. 2,500 words is approximately 80% of all text. And as I said, because they are very, very frequent words, students will see them everywhere. They will be repeated everywhere. They will be, they will be being encountered by students everywhere. So it's not ridiculously difficult or very taxing to get to that level. The problem then is to move on from there and to get to a knowledge base of something in the region of 7,500 to 9,000 words. To do that, you have to learn 5,000 new words. And by definition, those 5,000 words are not very frequent. They don't come, as I would say, for free. So that's an issue because to move from understanding 80% of all text to here, which is understanding 90% of all text. It's a big jump. And those 5,000 words, as I said, do not come for free. They are not frequently um, encountered. And we need to engineer the encounters with those words, and in particular, the, the re-encounters with those words. So this seems to be um, a, a big problem for, for uh, and maybe one of the reasons why um, students often kind of plateau, that you've heard probably the term the intermediate plateau, one of the reasons why they plateau at this, at this level and don't necessarily move on very quickly from here, um, it's because what uh, they have in front of them is, is learning 5,000 plus uh, new words. So what is the solution to this? Well, it's not rocket science and it's not particularly, um, there's no easy answer. It's a lot of work. But I think as far as teachers, <clears throat> and in my case, um, materials writers are concerned, we have uh, three big jobs, shall we say, or big tasks. Um, the first one is to try and provide as memorable as possible, a first encounter with words. Um, it's been proven over and over again that the more neurological activity which is occurring when students encounter words for the first time, the better it is. So um, trying to, you know, using anything at your disposal, um, uh, from, from, from smells to touch to physical activity, maybe electric shock treatment. Um, I'm just joking, obviously. Uh, anything that will associate the first encounter with words with as much uh, um, neurological activity as possible will help embed that word and will help the, uh, the memory traces, which is so important. The second thing we need to do is um, to do our best to encourage effective word learning strategies and this is an ongoing process of trying through um, the materials that we use and through our skills as teachers to show best practice in terms of how to learn, store and uh, practice um, uh, words um, and vocabulary. And that's a, a very important task that is, as I say, never ending. It's ongoing. And the third issue is, of course, we have to engineer um, re-encounters with words. Um, and we have to encourage our students to do that too. And we have to use other things at our disposal, such as um, spaced repetition through uh, vocabulary apps and all the re uh, more modern uh, opportunities we have so that the students get those seven plus encounters with a word for it to uh, have the possibility of moving from short-term memory to long-term memory. So these are the things which uh, we believe in and these are the things which we attempt to do um, in focus 
uh, and in our teaching generally. So let's have a, a, a more detailed look at, at, at how FOCUS addresses these, uh, these issues, shall we say, or these challenges. Um, one of my favorite uh, sayings in English, uh, this is a friend of mine, by the way, that's not me. Um, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And so it is with words. So making those words as memorable as possible, uh, or the first encounter with them as memorable as possible, is important. The issue, of course, is that we have inevitably to return again and again to the same old topics. The topic of family, the topic of travel, the topic of sport, the topic of houses. The same topics come up over and over again, and that's to be expected. So our attempt always as teachers and as writers is to find a, a new angle, a slightly different angle on those topics to make those first encounters more memorable. Here's some examples um, from the course. Um, let's take family, okay? Uh, a topic which you probably would get going at very early on and add to as you go through um, A2, B1, B2 maybe. Um, now here is a, a photo uh, on the left of um, the kind of wholesome North American family which textbooks are full of and um, it's difficult for students to really get much from these types of photos because they're people probably who don't exist in the sense of they're not the real names, there might be not a backstory, they're just a nice looking bunch of folk and from this we're meant to learn the different terms of kinship or what have you. Um, in uh, our book uh, Focus we're looking for something different so here we have a, a very interesting example of a family uh, made up of a black father and a white mother. They have a set of twins, one of whom is black and the other is white, and they have a further set of twins, one of whom is black and the other is white. Now this immediately is, I think, more engaging as a family unit uh, than the family on the left. And this is the kind of thing that we're looking for. And indeed, in the um, book itself, if, if you can see uh, here, uh, we have this um, this uh, particular. Ooh, let me put it there. Yeah, we have this particular uh, um, family uh, as the topic of a reading, um, and uh, it's immediately more um, motivating, I think, uh, for for the students, and and therefore likely to be more memorable. By the way, the only reason that this can actually happen genetically is because the uh, the black guy in his past must have had a white uh, a white relative, a, 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 a white ancestor. Um, so that's the sort of thing I mean by trying to find. Okay, the topic is family. Everybody has to teach family. It's just finding some sort of an angle, some kind of an edge on something which uh, which will help uh, will help memory. Here's another um, example, houses. Okay, so on left we have a typical cutaway of a house used in a, in a textbook. Um, everything is nicely illustrated, very clear. Uh, but again, I don't think it's maybe as memorable as what we've used um, in our book, which is, um, I don't know if you can see this, uh, the Hobbit house. Um, and the Hobbit house, is a house made by a guy in a wood somewhere in Wales. He took three thousand uh, pounds to make it and he made it from all the natural things that he found. It's a fascinating adventure um, and indeed a fascinating project but we can still teach the same sort of um, language uh, but with a much more interesting house as our um, starting point. So that's uh, another example of a different type of way of or a, a more um, memorable way of doing what is quite basic um, vocabulary. Then um, just finally uh, another way um, sports uh, obviously they get taught quite early on and similarly to the house really we've just seen you might get a sort of collage of various 
sporting equipment um, and they might be labelled. I don't think that's as motivating as um, contextualising the language which you want to teach. And here we have various words for kit, for places that you play sport or do sport and various types of sport, but they're in the context of a sports quiz. And so the student's main focus really is to try and do the quiz. And as a side product, they have to learn the language, they have to learn the words so that they can achieve uh, the highest score that they can on the, on the quiz. So putting language into context of this kind, a kind of quiz, something like that, a questionnaire, is an oft, often a, a better way than simply labeling diagrams or having labeled diagrams as the starting point. Um, it's giving the students a real uh, need to learn these uh, particular words so that they can um, uh, do, the, do the quiz. So those are some very briefly some examples of ways in which we're constantly looking to try and make the first encounters as memorable as they can be. Um, but then after that, as I said, we need to um, teach, uh, and this is an ongoing thing, effective word learning strategies um, as we as as we teach and as we go forward uh, with our with our classes now all of these are important and i could have listed another another 10 um, i've put these here because these are things that we do in focus now um, they're fairly obvious things um, uh, trying to give the students an ability to guess from context um, using dictionaries in a better way um, introducing uh, mnemonic systems, lots of extensive reading, that's something I believe in very strongly, uh, watching videos with subtitles, using word cards, maybe the paper ones or digital ones, um, learning high frequency affixes. These are just a selection of things that we should be doing day in, day out with our students to try and improve their ability to deal with words. Um, but the one I really want to focus on uh, for our webinar is the last one, recording vocabulary um, in effective ways, because I think this is something which um, a lot of um, course material forget. Uh, obviously, students off their own bat will be recording the work that they're doing. Some of them will be scribbling. Some of them may um, be keeping very neat um, vocabulary workbooks. But in my experience, it's simply a word that they find and then a quick translation and move on. What we've tried to do in focus is to introduce a whole area of recording vocabulary and bringing vocabulary to the front, if you like, not just to the front um, of the book, because the vocabulary spread, shall we say, is always the first um, page uh, in, the, uh, in each unit. But more importantly, and this is what I, I would like to, to show you. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this very well. But we have, uh, one second, we have, all, we have a kind of three-page um, unit. Um, so we have the two pages where vocabulary is introduced, hopefully in this case the Hobbit House in an interesting way. And then we have this third uh, uh, page, shall we say, which opens out and, as you can see, uh, corresponds nicely with the material that is done uh, in the in the book. Um, and this is what we call the word store. Uh, the word store is an attempt to get students to investigate or explore different ways of recording vocabulary as they go through the book. So. In this particular case, which is about uh, describing houses, um, we have a, a, a first um, uh, instance of very simply um, looking at the words that come out of the text because all of the words are contextualized first and then completing, in this case, a kind of categorization of words. But this is the, on the right hand side, you see the word store page and it's got lots of other things. And I'd like to go through some of the the sorts of things that we ask our students to do with words as they are recording them. Because as I said, a lot of course materials will present language, they will present 
words, vocabulary. They will practice vocabulary. Um, they will put students in situations where they are supposed to produce that vocabulary, but not very many of them focus on how you record vocabulary. And I think giving the students a lot of different strategies, techniques on recording is a very good way of um, helping them memorize uh, language as they, as, they, as they move through their course of instruction. So here are the ideas or some of the ideas which we have um, as we uh, uh, go through the book and use the, the words. So these are the sorts of things we've got. So here, obviously, putting uh, words into word families, uh, going from noun to adjective. We might go from verb to adjective. We might go from uh, noun to verb. So we are collecting constantly uh, and looking for possibilities of identifying word families, which is a great way of um, increasing the student's uh, vocabulary. Obviously, collocations, as they come up, uh, looking for those that are um, uh, uh, presented in context and, and identifying them. Um, some of the language is often very context dependent or situation dependent. Uh, here are some phrases which are very useful when you're shopping. Um, so we would collect those together. Um, trying to learn words or restore words uh, in terms of uh, connotation, positive and negative connotation. So adjective antonyms, but it could be synonyms. Um, so looking for ways where we can store words uh, in, in terms of um, how different or the same they are um, is, a, is a useful thing. Um, moving through, obviously, uh, mind maps, uh, some people call these, or um, word maps, some people call them word diagrams, word trees, I think I've heard before. These are all uh, great ways around topics. So the topic is art, um, and we can make um, our students uh, um, uh, build these maps um, as, as, they, as they go through. Um, or sometimes a set of uh, vocabulary or a set of terms um, suggests a particular system or a procedure and therefore why not try to record it in terms of that procedure. Uh, this is the justice system. Um, so, you know, crime is committed, a suspect is arrested, victims, uh, witnesses are interviewed, evidence is collected, etc, etc. And so this is quite a nice way sometimes um, learning things in a sequence, uh, which, is, uh, which is natural. Um, other things might be uh, learning or, in, or recording things in terms of clients. Um, here we've got positive versus negative adjectives um, and the students try to put those words uh, on a client like that, deciding which is more or less positive. Um, clients can be used uh, in all sorts of different ways. Then um, other things are grouping words or grouping um, expressions around the very common, what we sometimes call delexicalized verbs like get, take, put, bring, um, make, do, etc that um, are useful um, to collect all of those types of expression together sometimes. So you can see uh, patterns and uh, systems emerging. Um, sometimes it's good to, in this 10th example, focus on um, confusing words uh, and try and nail exactly the difference between, I mean, obviously this is quite a low level, but the difference between job and work, how those can be used, that's quite useful sometimes. Um, and jumping from 10 to 12, actually, little thing, just remember this, we put throughout the book on little uh, slight differences of meaning between things which may look very similar to the students. So we try to explain just the nuance of difference between, in this particular case, to go shopping and to do the shopping. Um, and then another area which we've tried uh, hard to address is uh, cognates. Um, teachers get, you know, very excited about um, false friends, uh, um, but it's quite nice sometimes just to, you know, admit there are an awful lot of what we might call international words. I see that you're all from various different countries, but 
I would assume that uh, actor, DJ, mechanic, model, photographer, secretary have words in your language which are very similar, um, if, not, if, not, if not the same. Um, in some cases not, of course, but uh, you know, it seems a waste of time to be spending any uh, much time on uh, teaching meanings of words which are clearly cognates. Of course, we need to teach the spelling, we need to teach the pronunciation, but we don't need to spend a lot of time on meaning if it's the same word in your own language. So those uh, words for free are, are another feature uh, of what we, what we try and do. Um, the other thing I should say before we uh, move on from, from this area of providing students with um, strategies is that um, words uh, appear everywhere, obviously. I've shown you the uh, word store here, um, but we have words uh, or vocabulary appearing on the first uh, two pages of each unit. But then, of course, you know, we might be going on to um, grammar and listening, but words are still here. This is still a page of words. So what we do at the uh, bottom here, if you can see here, is we still, this is very difficult to do this upside down, we still try to take from that, uh, those two pages, words which we can then also add to the word store. So what I'm trying to say to you is it's an ongoing process. It's not, vocabulary doesn't just happen on the first spread. It happens on the second uh, two pages, the third two pages, etc. It happens throughout the book. And so we try to capture all the words that are useful for that particular um, topic area, not just the ones on the vocabulary pages. Um, the third area, which I think is the most difficult for teachers. Um, OK, so we've talked about trying to make sure that the first encounter with words is as memorable as it can be. Well, we can do that. Um, we've tried, we, we've talked about uh, trying to um, teach best practice in terms of effective uh, word learning strategies, um, and that's an ongoing process. We can do that. Um, much more difficult is to build in this third area, which I think is uh, the most important, which is engineering uh, the recycling of vocabulary as we go through uh, a course. We're often very, very uh, keen to sort of get to the end of a course um, and to walk through as quickly as possible. Now, as I said, that's the linear approach, but learning isn't linear. It's very messy. So this um, engineering recycling of words is, is crucial. Now, you'll have to take my word for it um, that um, Focus does this. Um, in our, I mean, we have spent a lot of time, uh, my co-author Sue Kay and myself, in trying to make sure that the words that we introduce, the words that we present, are recycled in all sorts of different ways through the course material. Um, and just some of the things which are available for teachers here will be doing this. The, the, the typical, for example, in the teacher's book, um, some of these kind of uh, photocopyable type activities, um, which will be recycling words presented in the, in, the, in the student's book. The workbook, of course, does that, and um, that's the uh, main thing for the students. But of course, My English Lab will be doing that too. Um, and there are some exam practice booklets which are helpful as well for specific areas of vocabulary and use of English. So the material, um, please trust me, <laughs> does do this recycling for you, this systematic recycling for you. But of course, and I'd like to finish on a sort of more personal note here uh, and, and talk to you about how I try and capture things, because of course, what's in the book, what is in the course, isn't everything that gets taught. And as teachers, um, things or stuff, as I call it, comes up in the classroom. Um, so yes, of course, we're teaching our book, we're teaching the materials that we have, but any teacher uh, will be reacting and should be reacting to circumstances in the particular class on that particular day, things come up and at the end of a lesson, maybe your whiteboard or blackboard uh, is covered in words like this one, 
um, some of which have been from the book, but some of which have just come out of that particular day and that particular time with that particular class. And so um, I'd just like to spend uh, three or four minutes um, talking about this because I think this is a, a crucial area. The problem with this, whereas stuff that's come up in the book, um, you can trust uh, us to know that it will have been or it will be recycled systematically the seven, eight, nine, ten times that it needs to be. But stuff that comes up in the class, of course, may not be. Um, often what will happen is a very um, exciting lesson happens and then at the end of the uh, class, the, the teacher just rubs all this stuff out and goes on to the next class. Um, what I do in my classes is I've introduced class scribe, um, which is a very simple uh, idea where there is a, a blank sheet of paper and the students copy. They take it in turns. One of each of them is a class scribe on uh, each different day. They have a rotor system, a routine, and they just basically record what has happened in the lesson. They're, it's their responsibility to catch or to capture what has gone on. Uh, and and, and um, so these are just some of the examples of the sorts of things which uh, which have happened in my classes um, through the years. These are quite old, actually, some of these, but it's the sort of things that you might get, uh, quite interesting <laughs> illustrations. Um, and uh, this is something which I think is, is uh, really, really useful to kind of capture the uh, ephemera, if you like, or the, the, the peripheral material that comes up in a class at any one moment. Um, why is it a good idea? Well, it provides a unique record of each lesson. It helps improve classroom dynamics. The students feel as though they're um, part of a, you know, they, they work out the system, they work out the route of themselves and they tell each other, um, it's your turn today, it's your turn today, what have you. It, for me, reveals learning styles and difficulties sometimes, which is useful. But most of all, and most importantly, and most pertinent and relevant to what I've been talking about today, is that it systematizes or allows you to systematize repeated exposure of the material that you have taught. This isn't just written on the board and then disappears. This becomes part of, if you like, your classroom corpus. OK, most times your classroom corpus will be the book, the material in the book, but you have all of this as well. And it's not insignificant. This can over the course of a year can be thousands of words or certainly hundreds of words um, that may not be in the uh, in the course book. And um, finally, I'd just like to share my three favorite activities um, to um, uh recycle one thing is recording them but then you have to build them into the lessons as you go through the weeks and months of the term and um i've got hundreds in my repertoire but these are my top three simple things uh that you can do to recycle the vocabulary that you've caught through class scribe or or that you've mixed maybe with some of the material from the book um, the first one is odd one out uh, so here's the board um, three lines, uh, 12 different words. I usually try to revise 12 to 15 words. Anything less isn't worth it. Anything more gets a bit unwieldy and a bit complicated. So maybe 12 words. Um, the students, this is would be, for example, from um, a lesson which was to do with, with family. Uh, if you remember the, the black uh, father and the white mother and their family. So we're doing kinship terms. And the students look at this on the board. And by the way, all of these, uh, well, I'm only doing three, but uh, they require nothing from you, no preparation at all. You just choose the words, you have a pen, your brain, and that's it, um, and a board, of course. And so you put these on the board, and, and, and they are usually 10 minute activities. So you might start the lesson with them, you might put them in the middle of the lesson if the lesson's flagging or something, or you might have finished early and so you would uh, do them as a, a 10 minute filler at the end. So you choose your words, they could be anything. In this particular case, you put them uh, into uh, groups of four, could be three, could be five, but let's say four, and the students have to look at them and decide which is the odd one out, which one doesn't um, belong in the set. 
Uh, I'm sure you, you must have used this yourselves. I'm seeing lots of people recognizing this. Uh, but the great thing is that uh, it's so versatile. You can put any words in there. And most of the time, the students would think about meaning of the words. But sometimes it could be, um, well, I don't know, for example, it'd be uh, cheeky, attractive, charming, gorgeous. Maybe the students think it's cheeky because uh, cheeky is rather negative, whereas attractive, charming and gorgeous are positive. But maybe I've decided, for example, that the odd one out is attractive because it has three syllables, whereas cheeky, charming and gorgeous only have two syllables. Do you know what I mean? You can, you can, you can choose the criteria, you can make the rules up almost as you go along. It doesn't really matter. The most important thing is that the students are looking at those words and they have a task to do, which means that they are re-engaging and re-encountering those words. So odd one out is a very flexible type of um, activity to do. The next one is bingo, something which uh, I use a lot. In this case, I would put 12, 15 words on the board. Um, and here I'm um, revising, let's say, um, words which have come out of my lesson um, on, the, on the Hobbit House, okay, which are words to do with environment, buildings, um, etc. And what happens here is you put the words on the board, um, the students choose three or five. You decide. Depends how many words you put on. But let's say they choose three. So they write three words, any three words. It doesn't matter. They write them. And then when they've everybody has three words written down, you as the teacher start to describe these words one by one. And obviously you do it in a random order. So you say, for example, um, well, uh, this particular thing uh, describes um, the earth when it has rained. Uh, it gets uh, very dirty. So dirt, when rain is involved, um, can lead to an area which is full of this stuff. OK, whatever. You start, you just um, describe a word. In that case, it wasn't very good, but I was describing mud. Um, thank you, some of you got that. So the point being, you describe the words, and if the students think that they have one of these words written down, they cross it out. And then when they have crossed out the three or the five words which they've written down, they shout bingo. OK, and as a teacher, because you know your students, what you do is that you make sure that you describe the words which you think they will have most difficulties with first. Um, it's kind of psychological games there. The point again, like odd one out, is that you they simply need to look and consider these words for as long as possible because that is their next encounter with these words. Now, I've said you describe the words. You might give a translation or you might describe the words in your own language or you might... Um, if you've got time, you might, uh, and you're doing some things on the phonemic script, you might hold up um, uh, word, you, you might hold up flashcards in the phonemic script of these words. Anything will do, uh, but the basic principle is bingo. And finally, and very quickly, um, what I call category uh, dictation. And this is a very simple way of dividing words, usually give them two. Um, uh, this was uh, to do with maybe the sports quiz, uh, which we which we looked at earlier. So you find categories two, maybe three, but no more than that. Two is best. Um, decide on the categorization. So in this case, I've just put inside and outside, and then I would just read the sports, and the students decide whether they think it goes inside or outside. So I would say uh, badminton, and they would write inside. I would put skiing, and they would put outside. Now, some of these, of course, you can do skiing inside. Um, in fact, I've been skiing inside, but um, it's unusual. So the, the categorization, it's up to you. You could do a categorization which is um, grammatical. So you could have, for example, countable nouns, uncountable nouns. 
Um, you could have a categorization which is to do with sounds or phonology. Um, you could have a categorization which is very personal, something like, for example, with clothes, you might have, uh, I would wear this, um, I wouldn't be seen dead in this. Okay, so there are various ways you can categorize things. But again, the whole point of this is not so much the categorization or the answers or anything, it's simply giving the students another encounter with the particular words that you want them to learn. So those are just three examples, um, simple examples, simple uh, games or activities which you can use to make sure that the students uh, uh, encounter words not just once, not just twice, but seven, eight, nine, ten times. Uh, because if they don't, then they won't be learning um, the, the vocabulary and you'll be doing them a disservice. So I think I will finish there. I'm sorry I've gone on a little bit too long maybe, but uh, there were some technical problems at the beginning. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope some of those things will be uh, ideas that you'll be able to use in your class. Um, I think we have some time for questions. So if any of you have some questions, you could type them into the uh, box and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, uh, it's going to be quite difficult because there's so many of you. <laughs> um, but let me try to, uh, if that's probably a good idea if I put my glasses on. Um, so I can't read some of these. Okay, well, thank you very much for all your thanks. So all of you are uh, thanking me. Ah. Let's see. Um, um, no particular questions here. Oh, I can't see it. I need to keep doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no particular questions here. Useful tips. Uh, ah, how many times do you think students need to encounter where? Well, as I said, seven. Seven is the golden number, um, but it's in some cases it's more, in some cases it's less, but at least seven. Uh, uh, large, what about large groups of students? What sets of exercises would you recommend? Well, I mean, that, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, but if just the three I've done, I've done them with classes of 50, I've done them with classes of 10. So uh, they're fairly teacher-centric. Uh, you just need yourself a board. So those are those are easy to do in large classes. Um, most things are easy to do with large classes if what the students have to do is simple. So yes, no, or um, uh, true, false, or something like that. Um, okay, uh, new angles for old teacher. <laughs> um, uh, could you share the slides? Possibly, yes. I think this will be... Uh, a session which goes onto the Pearson site, probably, um, unfortunately, because I hate seeing myself uh, again. Um, uh, yes, so the information will, I think, be going up on the Pearson site. Um, do I let my students use mobiles or computers or tablets? Well, um, yes, of course. Um, I do. Uh, as you probably re realise at the very beginning of this talk, <laughs> I'm not particularly technically uh, advanced. My students are much better than me. But particularly smartphones these days are amazing tools to be able to use in the classroom. Not just the apps that the students can use for vocabulary learning, but I use them to record, to film. Um, they film each other in the classroom. We upload those uh, so all sorts of scope with the new technology and I don't see anything wrong in in using it um, at all. Class scribe, what do you do with them when the lesson is over? Well, I keep them, obviously. I mean, it's very old tech, a piece of paper, but I keep them in a file. And sometimes, uh, depending on how big my teaching load is, I um, actually input them into um, a Word document um, and uh, I, I use them uh, to create worksheets and things like that. But basically, they're just kept in the classroom um, in a file and we use them uh, over and over again. So uh, 
How many words should be taught? Ah, how many words should be taught each lesson for teenagers? That's a good question. The, uh, oh, well, it's so difficult, isn't it? Um, and the answer, of course, is it depends. But most people feel that any attempt to teach, uh, in terms of new words, to teach more than, I don't know, let's say 12, 15, 20 words is doomed to failure. But of course, it, it, it depends. It depends how memorably you're teaching them. And it depends how quickly you follow that up with some recycling. Um, it also depends how close those words are to the to the student's native language. I mean, there isn't really any hard and fast world. I mean, no chance trying to go in and teach 100 words, obviously. Um, and, you know, if you've got um, if you've got an hour with students, then uh, it'll be it'll be in the region of 15, 20, maybe 25 words. I don't know. But um, I think you are the person who can best answer that um, because you will know your students um, and, and what's at your disposal and you will know the differences in the particular case of or the context of the language that you're trying to teach which words are closest to to your language and which therefore won't cause difficulties and which will cause difficulties um, you know phrasal verbs are a mystery to students for example and uh, and therefore maybe you know your target be lower with things like phrasal verbs um, it depends it just depends um, is translation useful? Yes, is the answer to that. Obviously, uh, I'm a strong believer in um, using the students L1 if possible. Sadly, I, <laughs> when I teach in Spain, I'm OK because I can speak Spanish. When I teach in France and teach French students, I'm OK. Uh, but in other cases, um, I, I struggle. But uh, yes, of course, um, translation is, is uh, a very useful tool in the classroom. Um, uh, somebody else has asked something here we could tell us about. Course. Is Focus a course book or extra material? It's, uh, it's a course book. It's a very, very comprehensive course book um, with all of the components that I, um, I showed you earlier. Um, because it's useful, yes, we've had that. Uh, Pre-exam. Uh, yes, it, on exams, I didn't really touch on exams, um, but as you can imagine, being a uh, an upper secondary course, um, Focus does um, do a lot of exam practice. Um, uh, the style of exam question uh, are the ones which are to be found in things like TOEFL, IELTS, um, Cambridge First Certificate, and indeed the Pearson uh, Tests of English. So we have um, what might be called a liberal sprinkling of activities, which gives students very clear guidance on how to approach exam type questions and lots and lots of practice of that. And as I mentioned before, there is actually a separate booklet which the students can um, can use to uh, to give themselves specific exam practice. Um, what else do I have? Uh, people are talking about choices now. They've stopped uh, <laughs> talking about uh, focus. Um, that's all right. Um, what motivates? Oh, there's a, there's a philosophical question there. What motivates me personally? Uh, well, all sorts of things. But professionally, um, I still, after more than 30 years in the classroom, uh, really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy it. And I'm constantly trying to um, improve, constantly looking for new ways. Um, and I think you know, we are very uh, privileged as teachers to be able to help our students learn and move forward and progress. Um, and it's so varied. I mean, uh, you know, we're constantly getting materials to teach from and obviously we're constantly getting new students to teach. So uh, I think that's something which um, 
which motivates me very much. I'm uh, probably as motivated now as I was when I first started. Um, okay, we seem to be running out of questions here, which is probably uh, about time. Um, okay, lots of people are signing off now. So uh, maybe I should uh, take this as an opportunity to, to stop. Um, and thank you all again for participating, those of you who are still there. Um, and uh, please uh, ask your local Pearson representative for um, some copies of Focus.